Hello and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program's homeowner, homeowner webinar series. <clears throat> My name is Jen Marvin and I'm the Florida Yards and Neighborhood Statewide Coordinator. Today we have Dr. Norma Samuel speaking about fall vegetable gardening. Your microphones have been muted. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Please stick around until the end to take the survey. It should pop up in your browser automatically, so look for it before you close your browser. Um, the survey helps me give you the kind of programming you like and lets us all know how we're doing. This webinar is recorded. Look for it at the FFL website under resources, then webinars. It should be available within about two weeks. Our next presentation will be September 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern time on how to hire a landscape professional. So don't miss it. A little bit about our speaker. Dr. Samuel is, a, is the Associate District Extension Director for Central District with the University of Florida's Institute for Food and Agricultural Sciences Extension and a Florida Friendly Landscaping and Ur urban horticulture agent based in Sumter County. She serves as the current chair of the Caribbean Agricultural Extension Providers Network and president of the board of the Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services, an international nonprofit based in Switzerland. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees in plant production, pr protection and pest management from the University of Georgia. She also holds a PhD in agricultural education and communication with an emphasis in international extension and a minor in nonprofit organizations from the University of Florida. Before migrating to the US, she worked with the Ministry of Agriculture in Antigua and Barbuda on a research station and with the plant protection and quarantine unit. She has almost 20 years of experience as an extension agent in the areas of residential and commercial horticulture, master gardener coordinator, and 4-H youth development. She has over 300 publications in newspapers, newsletters, and peer review papers and curricula, and is the recipient of numerous professional awards. Dr. Samuel has been gardening since she was old enough to hold a hoe. She has a huge vegetable garden at her home where she conducted most of the episodes she hosted of Let's Talk Gardening on YouTube during the pandemic. She conducts a vegetable gardening series called Grow Your Plate, which will be available as a self-guided course on Canvas in September. Uh, Dr. Samuel, please go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Jen, for having me as the speaker. And I am very passionate about vegetable gardening. So I was telling Jen that they asked me to do the impossible task of talking about vegetable gardening in an hour. So um, be aware, I might be a bit over an hour. So I hope that you don't have any plans right at 12 o'clock. So what I'm gonna do today, I will give you some general information about vegetable gardening. And then I will go into some select crops that you can plant starting now and into fall. A lot of the information is just gonna be very um, basic or just an overview, I should say. And then the different resources that Jen mentioned, which I'll touch again on, you can go onto each one of those and get a lot more detail on the different crops and varieties that um, I grow in my backyard and also that's recommended by the University of Florida. Now, a lot of people usually relate Florida friendly landscaping to landscape and not vegetable gardening, but all the principles of Florida friendly landscaping do apply to vegetable gardening. And so I'm sure you're all familiar with these nine principles. So I'll just quickly run through them. Right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pest recycle, reduce storm water runoff and protect the waterfront. So all of these principles do apply to our, our um, vegetable garden. 
Now, one of the first things that you should do if you're considering putting in a vegetable garden is conduct a site analysis. So examine the area in your yard to see if it gets full sun. And when I say full sun, it should be around six to eight hours. Anything that you're going to plant that has a flower, so tomatoes or peppers or eggplant, they need to have that six to eight hours of full sun. If you're going to be growing greens, then you can get by about you know, five to six hours of full sun. But anything for blooms, you need six to eight hours. Ideally, it should be a level land. If your land is not level, then you can have some issues with erosion when we have heavy rains. So preferably select an area in the yard with level land. Drainage is going to be critical. So you want an area that drains well. If you have a low lying area, then you likely um, end up with disease problems and vegetables do not like wet feet. Your garden should be located close to a water source because your, your vegetables don't want to get wilted for an extended period of time because that will reduce yield. So select a site that's close to a water source. The soil pH is gonna be important and I will talk a lot more about soil pH in a little bit. Determine the size of the garden. And I usually tell people, you know, start out with a small garden, especially if you're gonna be gardening for the first time. So maybe like a 10 by 10 area or just a few containers because you don't want to start out with an unmanageable size and then get frustrated. So start out with a small area. And then as you learn how to have a vegetable garden in Florida, then you can expand. Plus the size can also depend on you know, your family, how many people you're trying to feed with your vegetable garden. And then the plant hardiness zone is important for you to know because it will also help to determine what you plant when. So this is a map of the Florida plant hardiness zone from the US Department of, of Agriculture. And what this map pretty much tells you is the average annual extreme minimum temperatures for the area where you live in Florida. And if you just Google um, USDA plant hardiness zone map, put in your zip code, then it will give you information on what zone you're in. So for example, if you're in Polk County, Polk County is in zone 9B. So the minimum temperatures on average for Polk County usually falls between 25 and 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is important to know as it will help to determine when you plant what. Now, this particular publication, Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide, I like to call this the Bible of Vegetable Gardening. And it was put together by these persons here. And it is an excellent, excellent resource. I've been gardening all my life pretty much. And I have this publication um, printed and I refer to it all the time. So if you ever utilize this, I will certainly recommend that you just do a Google search for Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide and um, print yourself a copy. Also, what I just found out today hot off the press is that this publication is also now available in the form of an, an online app. So if you just put into your browser, floridafresh.ifas.ufl.edu, you enter your zip code. When you enter your zip code, it will bring up for you what crops you can plant in your area for a particular time of year. So it has a little calendar that you can choose which month and it will tell you what crops you can grow in your area. And it gives you information on those specific crops, including varieties, depth of planting and all that. Also on this website, it gives you information on crops that are available or produce that are available each month of the year. So if you're, you're not able to grow something, then you can search to see what's available in your area that particular month 
not only for vegetables, but also fruits. And that's for the, the entire state. So this website, it gives you, and, and the fact sheet, it gives you information on a lot of the things that I'm gonna cover today. So, um, and in a lot of depth also. So do go ahead and download this resource. In that fact sheet, it has information on the planting dates. And when we talk about right plant, right place in Florida-friendly landscaping, also part of that for vegetable gardening is selecting of the planting in the so if you're not Florida, um, you might not be sure what you is in that fact sheet. If you're looking to grow broccoli, for example, in North Florida, August to February is the timing for that. In Central Florida, September to February, and South Florida, October to January. Now, it's that you use this time window to grow your vegetables. Because if you plant outside that time window, you're gonna end up with a lot more disease problems. So for example, I use that time window to plant my, um, to plant my broccoli. And for the entire growing season, we didn't have to you know, battle any pest problems because we planted within the window. Now, by the time April came around, um, we had kale still in our garden. We had um, kale still and we had some collards. And so April, May, we were beginning to see aphids coming in on those because they were still in the ground. Um, but at that time, I'm not worried about that because the crop has gone through most of its life already. So. I hardly ever have to spray because I stick to these planting dates. So I would highly recommend that you stick to what's recommended here. The research has been done across the state and this is the recommendation that they've come up with. It also gives you information on number of plants per 10 foot, days to harvest and things like that. Very important is the last column that tells you the plant family, and why is that important? Plants that are in the same family think, seems to, or I shouldn't say seem, but they are affected by similar insect and disease problems. So you don't want to be planting plants from the same family over and over because you're gonna have that particular pathogen or disease organism persisting. So if you rotate, that would be a way for you to help manage pest problems. So know the plant family of the crops that you're planting. Hey Norma, so, yes. would you shut your video off? We're getting a little bit of a lag on the audio and I think if you shut your video off, it will help sure. a little bit. Yes, I did see a message that says unstable internet connection. Yes. Okay. okay, let's One try minute. that, thank you. Okay. So where to begin? Soil tests, soil tests. In real estate, they say location, location, location. And for us, soil test, soil test, soil test. And so when you do your soil tests, I do recommend the comprehensive test that gives you the pH. So that tells you how acid or alkaline the soil is. And it also gives you information on what nutrients are in the soil. And so once you let them know what you intend to grow, they'll, be, they'll give you back the results um, based on the, the nutrition or the recommendation, the nutrition for the recommended um, crops. In this case, your home vegetable garden. You can get your soil test kit from your local extension office or you can just Google the UF Soils Lab and you'll find information there on how to collect the sample and submit the sample. Composting. Um, when I came to Florida, I was just so surprised at the sand that we have here. And I was like, how can anyone grow anything in this sand? 
And so for me in my backyard, we do a lot of composting. So we collect our kitchen scraps. And so you can see I have a container that I keep on my kitchen counter, collect the, kitchens, the um, kitchen scraps. And then um, over here, you can see my compost. So I compost in just, you know, regular garbage bins and just um, use a simple, I would say mine is a lazy method, but there are some people who are very precise with their composting. Um, so maybe you might be one of those. I'm sure at some point in time, there may be a session on here on composting or for your local extension office, but certainly look into taking a course on composting. The critical thing when you are looking to compost is the size. So the minimum size for your, your compost to reach ideal temperature is three And so um, that is the um, recommended minimum size. Here is also um, very easy. You can, you can use like wooden pallets. And the idea with this three bin system is that you would start putting your scraps here. And then when it's time to um, turn the compost, you flip it into the second bin. And then when it's time to turn, you flip in the third. And so by the time you get to the third bin, that compost is nice soil that is ready for you to use. Now you can incorporate that compost into your um, and you know, to help build the structure of the soil. And when you, when you add compost to your soil, it's gonna help to add nutrients and it's gonna help to that soil and also retain nutrient, um, retain um, nutrients a lot. So if you have never composted, I do recommend you begin to. And if you live in an area that at one point had restrictions. Um, now you're supposed to, you're able to have a compost bin because of the Florida friendly landscaping legislation. It's just that your HOA may tell you, you know, here's where you can locate your compost bin or maybe what material it might have to be made of in terms of the structure of the bin. So, um, do look in to see if your HOA have any restrictions in terms of placement or what the bin material should be. One of the decisions you'll need to make is how to design your garden. And the design that you select may depend on the, um, on the amount of space that you have. So you can plant directly in the ground and you can just till the area and then just line up the area and plant, or you could have raised beds or ridges like you see we have here, or some people what they do when they're planting like cucumbers, for example, they, they do a little mound. Now for me, I usually don't recommend people plant, you know, um, like cucumbers and squash on mounds in Florida, just because if you live in an area with sandy soils. The idea behind the mounds is to help with drainage. So if you have, if you live in a pocket that has clay soils, then the mound is a good idea because when you plant on that mound, if you have a lot of rains, then you will have better drainage. But for sandy soils, I don't really recommend um, mounding. Um, raised beds and your raised beds could be lots of different materials. So you can see in the bottom left photo, this is a raised bed. Um, and this is from the community garden in Wildwood. So you can determine what materials. So do you want to just use these, um, these type of lumber? Do you want to use bricks? Do you want to use, you know, galvanized? So there are different materials out there that you can use. It all depends on your budget. Or you can use containers and there are lots of different containers. The, um, the good thing about containers is that, you know, you can choose any type 
and it also helps with disease problems. So for my garden, for example, all my solanaceous crops, which are the tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, we grow those in containers just because of the problems that we have with nematodes. So the containers can be useful um, to help prevent that. And when I use the containers for that, we put a plastic, um, we have a, a sheet of plastic underneath the containers just to prevent that, put a barrier between the container and the soil to help restrict the nematode problems. Um, you can also use hydroponics. Um, I am not an expert in hydroponics, it's not an, a topic that I teach, but I'm sure you can find someone in your county or nearby county that offers you know, um, training in hydroponics. Mulch, mulch, mulch. And this is one of the principles of FFL. And mulch has a lot of benefits. It helps to reduce weeds, prevent erosion. It reduces the incidence of soil-borne illness. So there's some diseases that, you know, they, they survive in the soil. So when you put a layer of mulch on the surface of the soil, then it puts a barrier between that disease organism and the foliage of your plants. So when you have rains or when you're watering, that disease organism doesn't splash up and hit your leaves um, to um, infect them. It helps to keep the soil moist, it also regulates the soil temperature. And based on this photo, you can see that it does give your plants a finished look. And you, you can use, oops, you can use, um, you can use grass. As you see there, um, you can use pine straw, whatever you want to do. Now, back in the day, when a lot of people were actually reading the newspaper, um, you could get like um, that the newspaper, the part that you read, not the glossy, not the glossy sales portion of the paper. And you could put like three sheets of that on the ground and then put your mulch on top. So that way um, you don't have to purchase as much mulch. So let's quickly talk about nutrient requirements and fertilization. So I touched already on soil testing. And so that is very important. Now, just like our body needs additional nutrients, um, need nutrients to survive, it's the same thing with your plants. And the nutrients required by plants are classified as major and minor nutrients. The major nutrients means that they are required in large amounts and the minor in small amounts. However, the minor nutrients are as important or sometimes even more important than the major nutrients, just because when you have a deficiency in minor nutrients, some of it can be fatal to your plant. So that is why you do need a soil test to see you know, what is missing so that you know, hey, I need to apply potassium, magnesium, sulfur, or whatever. And, um, Depending on what you have going on, you know, your agent might require a tissue test. And with the tissue test, you can also um, determine what elements um, are, are missing. So your hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon are those nutrients that are in the air. Now, the pH, as I mentioned before, tells you how acid or alkaline the soil is. And so this pH chart here gives you information on the nutrient availability of the different elements at certain pH. And so you can see here that a lot of these nutrients are available, let's say between six and 7.5, a lot of those nutrients are available in, in maximum amounts. Now, phosphorus, for example, the lower the pH, you see that phosphorus isn't readily available. 
Now, sometimes you may have iron deficiency in your plants and you can see here, you, the higher the pH, then you will have a problem with iron availability. So um, keep that in mind. Now, most of your vegetables are gonna do well between pH six to 6.5. And so you can see most nutrients, except for phosphorus, close to six is on the low side. Um, most of the, the nutrients are readily available at that pH. So tips regarding pH, um, as I said before, most of your vegetables are going to grow between six and six. Some of you are probably from up north, like in South Carolina and wherever, where it's common practice to lime. Um, in a lot of areas in Florida, there's no need to lime. So for us here in central Florida, where I'm at, our pH are usually on the high side. So we're usually trying to bring down our pH. So if you have a pH that's very low, you need to, that's very high, sorry, a pH that's very high, you need to bring down that pH. And one of the things that you can use is ammonium sulfate. You can also use sulfate of potash and murate of potash to bring down the pH. Now, if you ever need to lime or to add sulfur, keep in mind that this is not something that is gonna happen overnight. So it does take time for these chemical reactions to occur. When you submit your soil, test, you will get the pH of your soil and they will also give you information um, in terms of recommendation of liming and also if you need to apply um, apply ammonium sulfate or one of those to bring down the pH. So I highly recommend if you've never taken a soil test that you do so. Now, nutrient deficiencies usually show up in, in your vegetables and can affect production. And if you usually see the symptoms, the symptoms that occur in the young leaf or at the top of the plant, these are gonna be your micronutrient deficiencies. So these are your minor nutrients that are deficient for the most part here. So you can see that in this graphic. Then if you have the symptoms showing up on the older leaf tissue, so if for example, you see you have a general yellowing of the old tissue, then that's an indication that you might likely have nitrogen deficiency. If you see yellowing in the young tissue, then that's an indication that you have iron deficiency. So I do a whole class on nutrient deficiencies. So this is you know, just a brief um, touch on that topic. Now, what type of fertilizer to use? And fertilizers, you can use slow-release fertilizers, which is preferable. They're better for the environment. They feed your, um, your plants evenly over an extended period of time. Or you could use what we call quick-release fertilizers. So quick-release fertilizers, just as the name implied, they're going to give you know, a quick boost of nutrition to your plants over time. However, they are easily leach from the root zone and they also can burn your plants very easily. So you wanna make sure that you, um, you're not misusing um, quick release fertilizers. So you could use a combination of both um, if you'd like, especially if, you have a nutrient deficiency and you need to get a quick green up or quickly correct the problem. Um, so that's just some general information about fertilizers. Now, if you're planting your vegetables in containers, I recommend using a potting mix that feeds for three to six months. So that is usually enough time for that crop that you're growing. And so if you use a 
potting mix that feeds for that extended amount of time. Usually you don't have to do any supplemental fertilization. When you plant in containers, use a slow release fertilizer. Do not use a quick release fertilizer in your containers because you're gonna easily burn those. Um, I am not advertising for stay green, but that is just an example of a, of a slow release fertilizer. Now, um, from time to time, if you need a quick in your containers, you can use a water soluble fertilizer, which is one that you're going to mix and water and water the containers with. When to fertilize? That's usually a big question that gardeners ask. And how I usually do my vegetable garden is that I broadcast and incorporate fertilizer at planting. And so um, based on the recommendation that you have on your soil test, then you know um, how you need to distribute that fertilizer over the life of the crop. A balanced or complete fertilizer um, is recommended every three to four weeks, especially for sandy soils. Now, there's a difference between a balanced and a complete fertilizer. A balanced fertilizer is one that is like 10, 10, 10, or 6, 6, 6. That means that the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are all in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. A complete fertilizer may have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but they're not in equal amounts. So that's the difference between those two terms. So um, if you live in an area where you have clay soils or your soil is high in organic matter, remember I said before, like when you add compost to your soil, it helps to retain nutrients. And so that's why the recommendation here is four to six weeks um, in terms of when to fertilize, every four to six weeks. The 2% phosphorus rule that is for lawns in Florida does not apply to vegetable gardens. So um, depending on what your soil test says, you can apply more than the 2% phosphorus. Um, so that doesn't apply here. Um, most of the soils in Florida are high in phosphorus, so keep that in, keep that in mind. So you don't want to be overutilizing phosphorus. Now, how to apply dry fertilizers? And this is a graphic that I put together for my um, Grow Your Plate Vegetable Gardening class because people wanted to find out, you know, how, what exactly does the different you know, terms mean and how to go about it. So broadcast, if you have an area that you're planting, you just sprinkle the fertilizer over the entire area. So that is um, broadcasting. So the entire space get fertilized. Now, these are the three methods of what we call side dressing. So the blue dots represent where you have a plant. And so you can see the red lines here for banding is where you just come down your row, you make a band on each side, you apply in a band on each side. Whenever I apply fertilizer, I usually like to make a little trench and apply the fertilizer, then cover it over. That way um, the fertilizer doesn't volatilize because your fertilizer can turn to gas and it also, that gas can burn the plant. So I usually cover over my fertilizer. So that one is banding. With the ring, depending on how your plants are spaced, you can put a ring right around the plant or fertilizer right around the plant. So again, just make a little trench and apply that fertilizer. If the plants are very close, then you don't need to do a double ring um, between but just one that covers both right here. Then the drop method is where you just drop the fertilizer one part of the, um, at one side of the plant. And this 
is something that you could do for your containers, for example. Um, that work is a method that works well for containers. The only disadvantage of this method is that, you know, the roots will tend to, you know, probably be better on this side over here and you're not getting even distribution of the fertilizer. So I prefer the first two methods of application when it comes to side dressing. So how much fertilizer to apply? So just in case, just in case you did not do a soil test, this is, this is the, um, the recommendation. One pound of 10, 10, 10 per 100 square feet or a 100 foot row. Uh, so you can take out your camera and take a picture of this slide. So you have this to use as a cheat sheet just in case you, um, you didn't do a soil, a soil test. The other recommendation is two pounds of 51010 or 5105 per 100 square foot or 100 feet of row. Then if you're using ammonium sulfate, which is just nitrogen, you apply two and a half pounds per thousand square foot area of your garden. And then if you're using blood meal, which is 15-1-1, you apply three and a third pounds per thousand square foot area. So this is just um, a cheat sheet for you. Sometimes you apply fertilizers and your fertilizers don't work. And these are some reasons why your fertilizers do not work. The pH um, is probably too high or too low, depending on what nutrient you're applying. You know, you may have problem with that nutrient being bound and cannot be up, you know, cannot um, be taken up by the, by the plants. Watering, so you probably overwatered or you did not water the soil composition. So if you have a very sandy soil and maybe you overwatered, you know, that nutrient quickly got out of the root zone. Fertilizer placement and amount. And I just explained the fertilizer placement. It could be that you had nematodes or some other root problems. And nematodes are just um, worm-like organisms that what I simply explain it as they clog the plumbing system of your plants. And so that affects the uptake of water and nutrients. So if you over fertilize, you can get excessive foliage and fewer flowers. And so you wonder, well, why does my tomato plant look this good and I'm not getting much flowers? You know? that could be the problem. You could burn your plants and you can also be polluting the environment. Irrigation, and this is very important. So remember I said, make sure you locate your garden close to a water source. And micro irrigation, which is drip or soaker hoses is highly recommended just because it saves water, it's a 90% efficiency in terms of usage of that water by the plants. And it keeps the, the fertilizer in the root zone longer. It also reduces the incidence of disease problems because you don't have a lot of um, the, the pathogen or disease organisms splashing up on your plants. And then of course, it will also reduce the incidence of weeds. On the other hand, you can do overhead irrigation, simply hand watering, or you can use a sprinkler like you see here. As you can see, the efficiency reduces by, um, by 40%. So you have a 50% efficiency here and you can have disease problems. The time of day that you water is also going to be important. So try and finish watering by 10 a.m. in the morning. Do not water late in the evening because your vegetables are going to be wet for an extended period of time. And that is going to um, create a problem so you'll have more diseases. If you water by hand and you have to water late in the evening, direct the water to the base of the plant. Um, reclaimed water, 
this is a question that we get all the time. Can I use reclaimed water for my vegetable garden? And according to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, you should not use reclaimed water on vegetables that you're not going to cook or peel. So if you're not going to, you know, so lettuce, for example, is one that you wouldn't want to use reclaimed water on because you're not going to be applying any heat or peeling or peeling that. So I just usually tell people stay away from reclaimed water. Now, many people collect water in rain barrels and the university does not recommend using the water from rain barrels to water your vegetable garden just because depending on the roof material, you could have toxins from the roof um, that end up in water, also bird droppings and algae. And so that can create, you know, different problems for you health-wise in terms of, you know, your vegetables. So stay away from that water in your rain barrel and instead use it to water your landscape plants. All right. So seed or seedling selection, start with healthy plants. So if you go to the store um, or garden center and you notice plants like the eggplants I, I have here in the bottom photo, do not purchase that plant. So you can see here some general yellowing of the lower leaf and there's some type of disease coming in there on that leaf. And then there's some, you could see a little trail there. So there's a leaf miner problem also. So this is a plant that you want to avoid. And then that top plant there, that's a pepper, that's a healthy specimen. So you wanna make sure that you're getting, you know, a healthy specimen to start with. If you're starting out with disease plants, then you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, so they should look sturdy and avoid plants that are already flowering or fruiting. And I know, yes, you go in the, in the garden center, you get excited because you found a tomato plant that's already fruiting and you purchase it. If you're gonna keep it in that container that it comes in, because sometimes they do have them in big containers, if you're gonna keep it in that container, fine. But if you're gonna transplant it, I do not recommend because you're gonna get some transplant shock and whatnot. So start out with younger plants, um, that would be best. If you're going to grow your own seed, your own seedlings, which are the young plants, we recommend starting six weeks from your, your planting date. So for us here in, um, in, in Central Florida, I live in Marion County. So for example, we plant March 15th religiously just around that time every year. So then that means the beginning of February or late January, we will start our seedlings. Sources of seeds and seedlings. You can go to your local garden center, your big box stores, mail catalogs, online catalogs, and you can also save your own seeds. So this is just a few of the many catalogs that we get seeds from for our garden. And so my husband is like a seed addict. So, you know, um, I like to tell him I collect shoes and he collects seeds. Now, when you purchase your seeds, a lot of times you're not gonna use all of it, but those seeds can um, be viable or they will germinate years later. So for us, we keep our seeds in, uh, in little Ziploc bags. So if you go to like a craft store, you can get some little tiny Ziploc bags that jewelers use and you put your seeds in there and then you can put them inside like a, a, a big jar or a, a huge freezer bag and then you put them you know, like in the bottom door of your fridge, not the freezer, or you can get a, you can get a mini refrigerator just for your seeds. But we've had seeds that, you know, seven, 10 years later, we still get good germination from. Now, here's some terminologies that you need to be familiar with. 
when it comes to seeds. And there's always discussions about heirlooms versus hybrids versus GMO or genetically modified, um, modified seeds. Now, heirloom seeds are what we call open pollinated. So they're naturally pollinated and they're usually um, the, the um, they're not pollinated between different varieties. So it's usually the same variety. So they, that's the open pollinated. They generally take a longer time to mature and you can have little or no disease resistance. So that can be a big problem. However, you get excellent taste from your heirloom varieties. When you think of hybrids, just think of, you know, two people coming together to have a kid. That's a hybrid of both of them. So that's a simple way to think of that. So hybrids is what we call controlled breeding, and they usually mature earlier. You get good disease resistance and good quality. With genetically modified organisms, you're inserting a particular gene into that, into that crop and you're making it, for example, resistant to, um, you're making it, for example, where it controls a particular pest. Or in apples, they have a gene that prevents you know, rounding of the apple because you know when you cut apples, the apple will turn brown when exposed to air. So there's a gene, there's a gene um, for that. So these are the crops that are now available on the market that are genetically modified. And so when you go to the store, you can look in the catalog, you will say non-GM to to make the market. So false marketing. So um, these are the crops that there's a GMO version out there on the market. Okay, so let's quickly talk about planting and then we'll get into some specific crops. Plan your garden. So determine the size of the garden and what you're going to plant, the spacing between the plants, and between the rows. And you can get that information from that Florida Vegetable Garden Guide. Rotate your crops. So you need to have a plan, use your plan and you, you keep track. This is what I planted this season here. Next season or maybe every other season, you can rotate your crops. And remember I said your crop rotation is a cultural for you to control disease problems. So you really want to utilize that. Um, you may decide you want to keep your rows straight or you're okay with crooked rows. So if you are planting directly in the ground or in, um, in raised beds, you can use strings to make sure your rows are straight. The depth of your, of your planting is going to be important. Items like sweet corn, for example, uh, you can plant a little deeper than you would carrots because carrots are very small seeds. So it's gonna take more energy to send that seedling above the ground. So you don't wanna plant too deep or else they're not gonna come up above the ground. Um, so think about your between and within row spacing and that information, as I said, you can get from the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide and the seed packets usually have those. And you can start your garden from seeds or seedlings. So as a general rule, I plant my cucurbits for solanaceous crops. So your cucurbits are your cucumbers, squash, zucchini. Those are your, um, those are your cucurbits. So those, plant from seeds. So I usually don't buy those as seedlings. They germinate very quickly. Then from seedlings, your tomatoes, those are things that you plant from, from seedlings. 
Now, some of you may wonder sometimes when you buy seeds, why they have, a, you know, they're colored. So here you see sweet corn that's pink and cucumber seeds that are blue. And this is because these items have been treated with a fungicide to prevent, you know, the common diseases that usually occur in the seedling stage of the crop. So these are treated with some type of pesticide here. So make sure you wash your hands thoroughly when using, when you're done using those. All right, so let's quickly get in on some information on select crops. And I'm not gonna go into specifics on the varieties. If you take one of the other courses that I offer, you will get more in-depth information on characteristics of the different varieties that I have listed here. So September is a good time to plant cucumbers. They usually take around 55 days to harvest. They usually have separate male and female flowers. And so they send out a batch of male flowers first and then a batch of female flowers and then both coming out on the plants at the same time. Now, you do need bees and other um, pollinators to pollinate, your, um, to pollinate your cucumbers and squash. And so, no, this is not a crop that you would recommend putting on your back porch, except if you're getting one that's an all-female variety. Now, how do you know which one is male or which is female? And so the female one is going to have that little cucumber or little squash and then the petals or the flower at the top. And then the male is gonna have, you know, just the stalk and the rest of the, the flower parts at the top. So that's how you can distinguish between the two. There's, some, there's gonna be some times when you plant a crop this year and you get great production. And then next year, you use the same set of seeds and you get like all male flowers. And so sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. And they say weather has something to do with it. Sometimes it might be that you don't have pollinators coming to your garden, but just be aware sometimes on your cucurbits, you can get all male flowers, but don't let that stop you at all. Uh-oh, <laughs> what did I do? I accidentally clicked on the picture. <laughs> okay. Uh, summer squash. So this is a cucurbit. So you see male and female flowers. Sometimes on your summer squash and your cucumbers, you're going to see that some of the um, some of the plants are either very wrinkled that some of the, the fruits are very wrinkled at the base or they're just um, dying back as you see here. So it's turning brown. And that's because somehow fertilization did not occur well. So maybe you didn't have enough moisture and moisture is important in the pollination process. So once the pollen get from the male flower to the female flower, then you need moisture to help that germination tube to, ger um, to form and that fertilization of, of the ovules. So if that doesn't take place well, then you're going to see these things, these fruits like we are seeing here. So summer squash, the term is used to refer to, to, um, to squash that have a short storage seeds, storage. So that's gonna be your yellow squash and the zucchini. They're called summer squash. Then your winter squash, are those that you can spawn in a period of time, such as your butternut. So those can be stored for months. Um, right now into September, you can begin planting your summer squash. Um, as I said, these do not store long, so you'll have to store them in your refrigerator. And I just explained to you um, the reasons why you may get your fruits not forming well, so you can have 
fruit drop. They usually take around 40 to 50 days to harvest. And I have varieties listed here that you can try. Tomatoes, and this is a whole lecture, can be a whole lecture on its own. And September is a good time to plant tomatoes here in, in Central Florida where I'm at. So check the vegetable gardening guide to see um, the recommendation for where you're at in the state. There are different sizes of tomatoes. So there are hundreds of different varieties here. Every year we plant anywhere from 100 and, <clears throat> 130 to 160 different varieties of tomatoes in my backyard. When you're selecting tomato varieties in Florida, we highly recommend that you select a variety that has the initials BFN. So if you're planting heirloom, it's not gonna have BFN. So you, you have BFN and that's for verticillium wilt, fusarium wilt, and nematode resistant cultivars. Now it doesn't mean that it's not gonna ever get those diseases, it just means that if it does get the disease, it will still give you um, a good crop. Generally, tomatoes can take anywhere from 55 to 80 days to harvest. There's lots of different tomato varieties out there. You can have cherry tomatoes, small to medium sized ones. You can do large ones, or you can do heirloom varieties. A cherry tomato that we tried this year that I really liked was one called honeycomb, but lots of different options out there in terms of tomato varieties. When you talk about tomatoes, it's determinate versus indeterminate. Your determinate varieties are good if you have small space and you want to plant in containers. And then your indeterminate at once they're gonna keep on growing and growing and growing and they're gonna need staking. So you can see here, um, this particular farm that we visited here, they were using these cages and they were wide enough that you could put your hand through. Um, I have, I have um, concrete reinforcement wire is what we have in our backyard and so, when we moved into our neighborhood in 2004, they, there was construction all around. So there was, you could just go and get, you know, concrete reinforcement wire for free. And so we're still using those same cages from 2004. And you can also go to a store and purchase concrete reinforcement wire to make your tomato cages. Eggplants, now is the time to put eggplants in up to September. We still have our eggplant that we planted since March. And so two things that you're planting in your garden that can tolerate the heat and still produce that will last from spring all the way down to first frost are peppers and eggplants if you take good care of them. So I'm not gonna be planting eggplants this fall because I still have my eggplants from the spring. They are self-pollinated, so you can plant just one. And I like to tell people, you know, do edible landscaping. Eggplants is one of those plants that will look nice in your, um, in your landscape amongst your ornamentals. A question I get all the time is, when do I harvest my eggplants? And you wanna harvest them when they're still glossy. So you can see in this top photo here, this Ichiban variety that's on the left here, that that's kind of dull. So this means that this is more on the old side. So you want to um, get them when they're glossy like these others here. So your slender varieties are usually your, um, Ichiban or Japanese types. You have the large varieties, which are your black beauties. And then Rosita is a light purple variety, is an heirloom and Rosita originated in Puerto Rico. 
Bell peppers, the kids going to be similar to tomatoes. You can plant now through September and you want to harvest them when they're firm and crisp and they take anywhere from 65 to 70 days to harvest. There are lots of different varieties of bell pepper out there. California Wonder is one that, you know, I've known of that variety since I was a kid. So California Wonder has been around for a long time. One of the things I should, should have mentioned when um, talking about heirlooms is that if you, as a general rule, they usually say if a variety has been around for, I think it's 50 or more years, they tend to view those as heirloom varieties. So um, some, some, of, some varieties that have been around for a long, long time, they're beginning to look at them as heirlooms. Beans, there are lots of different beans out there. You can use bush beans or you can do pole beans. If you're using pole beans or any type of beans that run, of course, you're gonna need a structure for them to run on. So it could be like a fence or a teepee, something. The biggest problem you have with your beans are rust. And in terms of insect, bean leaf roller is one that you will find. So bush types are like Blue Lake, Contender, and Derby. Okra. Okra is another crop that will go through the entire season. It can take the heat. Um, March through August is the time when you plant okra and you side dress these about every three weeks. And if you plant okra, you're gonna be harvesting okra every few days, you're out there harvesting okra. Okra is very susceptible to root knot nematodes. So in my yard, we plant our okra in containers just because of, of that. Um, I was so excited when we planted um, this variety, purple variety of okra, but I was disappointed after you cook it, it turns green. So I'm like, that defeats the purpose of, you know, of planting uh, um, a purple variety of an okra if it's gonna turn green. And same thing with, the, with some of those beans too. So um, Clemson spineless is a variety that I've known from since I was a child. It has been around a long, long time. Burgundy is an, is an example of a purple variety. Radish, if you're new to gardening, if you are new to gardening, and you want to feel good about yourself, plant radish. And I hope you do like you do like radish. But radish is one that's going to be ready in 28 to 30 days. So that will just set the stage for you to think, well, OK, I can do this. I can do this. So radish is very easy to grow. And if you're gardening with kids, radish is also an excellent um, plant to start with. Um, sparkler, white icicle or some varieties. So you have these globe type radishes and you also have some that shape like carrots that you can plant. Cabbage, cabbage, you plant September through January and you can have problems with caterpillars. So here in central Florida, I plant mine and I, I should say these dates that I'm giving, these time frames that I'm giving you were all central Florida. So you need to find for your part of the state. So for me in, in Marion County where I live, we plant usually around um, November. And so we didn't have any problems at all in terms of caterpillars. But if you plant too early, or too late, you're gonna end up with pest problems. Diamondback moth is one of the main problems or insect problems with, with cabbage. And that's pretty much the major pest of, of cabbage in the world. Cauliflower, there are lots of different varieties of cauliflower out there now. You can get not only the white ones, but purple, green, and like a like yellow variety. So sometimes you have growth stress that induce um, what we call buttoning so that the, you know, 
they don't develop very well. Also, you can find this issue here. You see the hollow stem in the in the um, in the cauliflower. Sometimes you also see it in broccoli, and that hollow stem is believed to be caused by several things. It could be that the variety is a fast growing variety that it shows up in. It could be related to soil moisture, or it could be boron deficiency, which is a boron is a micronutrient. Now, when you're planting cauliflower, you need to do a process that we call blanching to prevent the cauliflower head from turning yellow. So you're pulling the first few leaves around the head over the head uh, and tying them there to prevent um, the heads from turning yellow. There's a variety called snowball that is a naturally blanching variety. So the leaves are growing towards the, the, the cauliflower head. So that helps to protect the head. Broccoli. August through January is the time to plant. And after you cut off that main head of the broccoli, you want to make sure that you don't, you know, don't pull up that broccoli yet. There are going to be side stalks that come up. And those side stalks, they're going to be smaller than the main head, but you can still get significant production from, from that. Um, the requirements are going to be similar to cabbage. And you can eat the leaves on your cabbage, on your, um, your cauliflower and your broccoli. So you just cook them as like, like you would collard. So you can, if you've never done that, that's something that you could do. Onions, and there are different types of onions. If you're going to be planting onions that bulb September through December is the time um, bunching onions, you can plant now through March in Central Florida. Um, in Florida, we specifically recommend that you look for short day onions when you're looking for onions to bulb. And short day onions are going to bulb when you have 10 to 12 hours of daylight. If you do long day onions, you're just going to get, you know, foliage and no, and no um, bulb. So when you go to the garden center, make sure that you check to see if it's a, if you're not familiar with the variety, check to see if it's a short day onion or a long day. If it's a long day onion, pass on it because it's not for our area. And that's the thing with some box stores, they carry things that are not recommended for our area. To get, good production on your onions, you want to make sure that you're following a, a, a good regimen on your fertilization. And so Texas A&M recommend that when before you plant, you make a trench about three inches deep, you put your, your super phosphate fertilizer down and you're using about half cup per 10 foot row. You sprinkle that in, cover it over and then plant your seed. So when the onion germinate, it has that phosphorus fertilizer there ready for it. Once the onion becomes established, then you apply ammonium sulfate, which is your 2100 fertilizer um, every month. And if you follow that regimen, you're pretty much guaranteed to get good results on your on your onion. Now, if you're gonna be doing dry onions, you want to wait until the neck of the onion breaks. So you see here that the top falls over and you shouldn't be watering your onions at this point in time because you want them to dry out. So do not water at this point in time. And once you do that, you cut the, um, on the top off about two to three inches above above the, the bulb, and then you store them in a cool, dry place to, to store. Nora? Carol, yes? We're gonna have to start wrapping it up. Okay, I'm almost done. Okay, great. The carrots you plant October through March, 
And they can take anywhere up to 21 days to germinate. So if you plant carrot, just be patient. I do not recommend transplanting carrot if you're growing your carrots for the roots. And they take anywhere from 65 to 95 to harvest. In terms of pests or insects, they are gonna be good insects, bad insects in the garden. So you need to be able to identify which ones are good versus which ones are bad, scout, scout, scout. So every time you go out in your garden, take a close look and see what's there. And your extension office is here to help you identify the problems. In terms of diseases, um, there are gonna be disease problems coming your way. There are three things that need to happen for you to have diseases. So you need a susceptible host, the pathogen and the favorable environment. If you do the things that I've already recommended, you should be good. Um, so managing diseases, there's no cure, purchase healthy plants, use resistant varieties, crop rotation, avoid working in your garden when wet and have good ear circulation. So follow the recommended um, spacing and avoid growing in hot, humid months. If you have to use pesticides, read the label completely follow safety requirements, use only pesticides label for the crops that you're growing and pay attention to the pre-harvest intervals. So how long to wait after treatment before harvesting and keep pets and children away from those areas. So in terms of more resources, I have videos on most of these crops in depth from my vegetable garden. So just do a talk for a uh, Google search for Let's Talk Gardening, UFI for extension, Let's Talk Gardening, and you can subscribe to that channel. And then the Grow Your Plate Vegetable Gardening series is going to go live in, um, in September. So you can look out for information on that. And so questions. Okay, let me um, look here in the, in the chat box. Um, can you repeat the size of the ideal compost bin? Three feet by three feet by three feet. Okay, great. Uh, hold on. Uh, advise what type of soil test to order. Most only give pH. Yes, yeah, so you want to get the comprehensive soil test from the um, from the the soils lab on campus, and they're ten dollars for that soil for that soil test. That's going to give you pH and also the nutrients and provide your recommendation as to what nutrients you need to fertilize with based on what's lacking. Okay, uh, how close to the plant should you get with the banding? Um, it depends on, on, on the plant and, and the size of the plant. So an older plant or, or one that's more mature, the roots are gonna be out more. So I usually do like the drip line as the, so where the foliage extends out, then you can use that as a guide, the drip line. Okay. Can you repeat why fruit drop? Okay, yes. So on, on different plants, your, your fruits or your flowers drop for different reasons. So it could be that you didn't have, you know, pollinators visiting your garden to pollinate. It could be that you, um, you have little water, so uneven watering, because moisture is important in the pollination process. So that could be a reason. You, in tomatoes, for example, when night temperatures are too high or day temperatures are too high, then you can have flower drop or poor pollination in tomatoes. So if you're gonna to grow tomatoes, 
in the heat of the summer, we usually recommend growing a variety that's heat tolerant. And so you can tell a lot of times by the name, so like celebrity, heat wave, heat master, as some heat tolerant tomato varieties. Okay. Uh, when it says days to harvest, is that from planting seed or planting a young plant? So it depends on the it depends on the on the crop. So some things, as I mentioned, you're generally growing them from seed. So if it's cucumbers, for example, it's from seed to harvest. Tomatoes, you're generally growing them from seedling. So it's from that seed seedling time you plant that seedling to harvest. Okay. Uh, for first time gardeners, can you recommend three easy veggies to plant in August and September? Something that will build my confidence for gardening. <laughs> so I would say, I would say definitely radish. Um, something that's easy to grow. And I would say, you know, plant it late September. So collards is one that could, you know, begin to take, that can take the heat. Um, collards and kale of your greens, those can take the heat more than the other um, leafy crops. So those are easy, those are easy to grow. Um, a third one I would say is zucchini. And just be prepared to get a lot of zucchini. But those would be three that I would recommend that you plant this fall. Are there any that can withstand salt or salt air? Um, yes, they are. Teresa Baburek, she has a, a, um, a blog and I can send you the link. She has a blog on the salt tolerance of the different vegetables. And so there's a few that she has there that are salt tolerant. So I remember tomato is one that's on that list. But um, I don't know if you do follow, if that person could give you their email and you can you, send them. If you could type it in the chat, if you could type it in the chat, it? that would be great. Okay, I would have to do a search for it. Okay. Yeah. So, any other questions? Um, uh, there's quite a few in the Q&A box. Okay. Is fish oil a fertilizer and is it recommended? I do not know fish oil. I do not know the answer to that question. So that would okay. be something to research. Okay. Um, what are some non-chemical methods for weed insects and animals? Okay. Um, so non-chemical options. So the first thing is your cultural practices are gonna be important. So making sure you don't overwater or too little water, don't over fertilize, um, making sure you're not watering late at night. So your cultural practices are going to be critical to you managing pest problems, whether it's insects or diseases. If you have a disease plant or a plant that's infested with insects, for example, you can pull, just pull that out, sacrifice that plant, or maybe cut off that branch that has that, or that area that has that. So when I did started the disease section, there was a, a photo that I showed there with cabbage that had a lot of aphids. And that was from, from the community garden in Wildwood. So when I visited, it was that single plant that had that. So I just recommended that they pull that plant out. So I would say your cultural practices are gonna be key to you managing your problems and not having to use any pesticides. So as I said before, for my entire fall season, we didn't have to do any pest control at all because we planted in the, in the correct time frame and we followed recommended practices. Um, 
in in the spring when we had like two three days of constant rain we put out you know copper fungicide we sprayed our tomatoes and peppers with copper fungicide just as a prevention for to prevent leaf diseases or foliar diseases so following the florida vegetable gardening guide is gonna be critical to your success Okay, um, what is better, complete or balanced fertilizer? It depends on it depends on on the crop and what your soil test recommendation says. So I would say do your soil do your soil test and go with the recommendation from there. But for your vegetable garden, if you're not soil testing, which I hate to say that. You can use 10, 10, 10 or 6, 6, 6. A one to one to one ratio fertilizer um, would, would work. Okay. Uh, do you recommend using, <clears throat> excuse me, a shade screen over your garden? Our green beans and tomatoes grew fast, tall and spindly, not many leaves or fruit. Any suggestions for us? So is the tomato getting spindly after the um is the tomato getting spindly after the after the shade plot going on? I think they're asking if you recommend using a shade screen. It, over it, yeah, over it the depends. Garden. So if you're growing greens, for example, you can use a shade screen. So if you're growing like lettuce and things like that. You can use a shade screen, but for other things like your tomatoes, peppers, um, they need full sun. So just full sun and make sure you have adequate moisture. Great. Um, it looks like that might, well, let's see. What does open pollination mean when referring to heirloom crops? Right, so heirloom crops as a general rule, according to seedsavers.org, uh, uh, um, open an heirloom must be open pollinated, but not all open pollinated plants are heirloom. So that's according to seedsavers.org. Now, as I said, an open pollinated plant is pollinated by natural mechanisms. So it might be wind, it might be bees, and um, you have that particular variety is pollinating itself and not mixing with other varieties. Okay. Let's take one more question. Um, do you recommend to let a, a raised garden bed to rest from planting at some point? Yes, so during the summer, we usually recommend solarizing during the summer. So what solarization, what you're doing with solarization is that you're getting like a six mil thick clear plastic and you're putting that over the, the, the bed. So if you're gonna incorporate any compost or anything like that, you do that. You wet it down, you cover, you put the plastic over, cover the edges, and you let it sit there for about six or so weeks. And you it will cook anything that's in there. So that's a good way for you to um for you to get rid of any pest problems that you're having. Um, the other thing you could do in terms of resting is that you could plant, you know, like a, um, a cover crop. So some type of leguminous crop that's going to add nitrogen to the soil and you can let it go in that cover crop for a season or however long. And that would be a way to rest the soil. But for a lot of people, they don't have enough um, space to, to do, you know, to leave it out as we call it. All right, so I did find the link. I'm looking for the question on, I'm looking for the question on salt tolerance. 
Uh, you can just type the link in the in the chat box. Okay. I will do that. Also, I just wanted to say if you are looking for the recording of this um, webinar, you can find it on the Florida Friendly Landscaping website under resources and then under webinars. Uh, it won't be posted until two weeks, about two weeks from now. So uh, look for it then. So I'm trying to go back to find the fresh from Florida. So here's the, or Florida fresh. Here's the link to the online app to the vegetable gardening guide. It's floridafresh.ifas.ufl.edu. Okay, great. Um, well, Dr. Samuel, I think this is uh, all we have for today. Um, thank you very I'm much. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> no problem. Um, thank you so much for coming on and um, sharing your presentation with us. You're very welcome. Okay, everybody Bye, have a great everyone. day.